Vicky does great work in Colossians and some of it we'll hear today. And we are in, so thrilled and excited to have her walking us through one of Paul's very important letters. Vicky, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, you will have um, a few minutes to walk us through the letter. And what we will do is, as you speak, we will create intervals for Q&A. So I hand over the mic to you, and uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Over to you. Well, thank you very much, Pat. And it's lovely to be here. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, thank you to everyone who's joining uh, for making the time to attend. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's lovely to be, be with you in this way. Um, you'll see my, my first slide there has a picture of, um, very distinctively South Australian with the um, Sturts Desert Pea flower, um, which can spread across the, the landscape. But in many other ways, uh, South Australia is rather similar to South Africa. I have actually had the uh, privilege of visiting South Africa once and, uh, and that and that's, uh, stays in my memory as something very special. I'm going to be speaking today particularly uh, from the perspective of the commentary that I wrote on Colossians, which was released la um, last year in 2020, uh, Colossians, an Earth Bible Commentary, an Eco-Stoic Reading. So you can see uh, with that title, um, I uh, am endeavouring to say that this is an ecological reading, but it's also drawing in ideas from Stoic thought. So I'll be saying a little bit more about why I do that and, and what uh, sort of um, insights that can bring. The, uh, the, the layout of today's presentation is in three sections. Um, I'm going to be talking at, in the first section about giving an overview of the letter and uh, also about the socio-historical context, the occasion and the dating of the letter. Then I'll pause for any questions at that point. The major part of, of my um, presentation is in section two. I'll speak, speak a little bit about some literary features uh, some scholarly debates uh, around Colossians and, uh, and particularly how the letter sits against um, the Greco-Roman philosophical background. Then in section three, um, I'll speak a little bit about major theological themes and also uh, speak with you about the letter's potential um, in terms of um, re relevance to the global South Southern Christian communities. So, uh, I, I'm looking forward to um, the conversation that we may, may have at that point. The letter um, of uh, Paul and Timothy to the Colossians is a, is a little gem. And I think perhaps in many ways, uh, uh, not quite as widely studied and known as, uh, as it needs to be. It's quite a, a, a wonderful letter. It's, um, we're told right at the beginning of the letter that it's uh, a letter from Paul and from Timothy. One might also say it, um, it appears to be a letter that, that uh, foregrounds Epaphras, who is the, the, the person who's brought the gospel to the Colossians and indeed to the other um, believing communities in the Lycus Valley. Um, I'm going to say a little bit more about authorship um, later but that's um, just in terms of the uh, overview um, uh, this is where I'm beginning it's it's written uh, to a community or set of communities really that are not known personally to Paul and Timothy so that's a little different from many of the um, of the Pauline letters we we know that from um, Colossians two, uh, chapter 2 verse 1 where Paul and Timothy write for I want you to know how much I am struggling for you and for those in Laodicea, and for all who have not seen me face to face. So um, it's flagging there that they're writing to uh, these communities in the Lycus Valley um, that, uh, that don't know them personally, but they feel a real connection with them, as, as we see in this letter. These communities were in the Pauline tradition in the sense that Epaphras is described as a, you know, a fellow worker uh, by Paul uh, in chapter 1, verse 7, um, our beloved fellow servant, um, and, and also in chapter 4 of Colossians, uh, Epaphras is described again. So um, these communities have been, uh, have received the gospel um, uh, from uh, Pauline um, missionaries, if you like, and, 
And so they are connected in with the, with the Pauline communities across um, Asia Minor. It's, they're made up of converts from uh, pagan religion, as we learn in uh, chapter 1, uh, verses 21, 27, and chapter 2, 11. And so these new believers um, are, are people who are needing to learn the faith really from the ground up. They haven't come via the synagogue. They've come directly from, from uh, paganism. Now, I mentioned that I'd say something a little bit more about authorship. Um, and, uh, and I think that um, this is quite a disputed question as I'll um, set out when I get down to the, the major scholarly disputes. Authorship is questioned as to whether this is really a Pauline letter or whether it's um, um, a, a deutero-Pauline letter. My position that I take in, in my commentary, um, and this is after considerable work uh, in the field of Colossians, is that Timothy is the main one who's drafted this letter, but Paul himself is still alive and, and, uh, and so not a, um, a fictional uh, um, account of Paul, but an actual account of Paul. To me, this is a really important um, uh, position to take because it's, uh, it's neat, it's elegant, it recognises that much of the, the language in Colossians isn't the standard uh, language of the, um, of the undisputed letters. But nevertheless, in terms of the situation of this letter and the concerns that it's articulating, it's actually very hard to find a plausible context um, if, if you cut it adrift from the actual um, life of Paul. I'll say a little bit more about the context um, uh, in a minute. In terms of themes, uh, there's a great th uh, emphasis on thanksgiving. Uh, Paul and Timothy model that uh, in the opening prayer and they advocate it in, um, in various other places throughout um, the four, four chapters of Colossians. There's also an emphasis on hope. Hope is a very important um, theme and it's hope in the face of suffering as we learn in chapters 1, 2 and 4. In terms of what exactly um, they mean by the suffering, that's um, a little bit debated. But nevertheless, uh, this is a letter that's written to encourage um, the community at Colossae and indeed the communities at um, Laodicea and probably Herapolis as well um, to persevere and to hold fast to the teachings that they've received. The letter is giving guidance to a new community of believers whose key leader, Epaphras, is absent. Of course, Epaphras is now with Paul and Timothy and no longer in the, in the Lycus Valley in Asia Minor with them. And so they are perhaps bereft and needing some, some guidance. It also reaffirms um, the community network of believers. And I'll say a little bit more about what I mean by that later. But just to say that this is um, uh, establishing and confirming uh, the way in which the, the Pauline um, team moves between communities and brings greetings and prayer and concern and possibly also practical help um, to, to the local communities. It, I think, is a very confident letter. And this is an important um, question because other scholars have, uh, have seen this, this letter more in the light of, of chapter two, where it talks about um, possible pressures that uh, the Colossians are under. But when you read the letter as a whole, it definitely has a ring that Paul and Timothy and Epaphras and the others that are with them are confident that the Colossians um, have a strong foundation in Christ and are continuing to live that out. So, for instance, in chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, as you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. So that assumes that they are established and, and well-grounded and that they are continuing to live this out. So it's not a letter that is um, uh, actively worried about, uh, about the falling away of the community, but, but there are hints, of course, that there are issues going on. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. All right, some words about context, occasion and date. So it's a prison letter. 
uh, as a number of our Pauline letters are. And we're told um, about Paul being in prison. Paul and Timothy are in prison, in uh, particularly in chapter 4, uh, verses 3, 10 and 18. Now, I, um, I uh, argue that this is the Roman imprisonment. There's no real consensus among scholars about whether um, this is the Roman imprisonment or indeed an earlier uh, imprisonment. Um, various other places have been considered. But I think that there is a good reason to think that this is Paul and his team uh, writing from Rome, partly because of the parallel with, uh, with Philemon. Uh, we have nine uh, names named in Philemon that are also named in Colossians. So it does seem to be a letter that's um, written in a very similar context with a similar um, group of people around Paul. And, um, and as, uh, as Pat mentioned, um, I have uh, looked at the whole question of the correlation between those groups of, of people and, and what that implies. And one of the things that I, um, that I argue is that Philemon is earlier than, um, than Colossians. One of the key things about that is that um, Anesimus, of course, in Philemon, his um, situation, his future, is still up for grabs. It looks a bit concerning about what's going to happen to him. Whereas in uh, in Colossians, by this stage, um, uh, Anesimus is now uh, going to be uh, a letter bearer along with Tychicus. So um, that whole situation of, of Anesimus and his uh, coming to faith and his being reconciled with Philemon uh, has been uh, resolved. And now he has moved into a position of leadership. Um, uh, and so that, that presumes at least, I reckon, a couple of years. Um, uh, and, uh, and so that's one of the um, ways in which you can date Colossians, I think. Another thing is that um, we know from other, other sources um, external to the New Testament that there were earthquakes in the Lycus Valley in this period. In particular, um, we know that Laodicea was um, very, um, <clears throat> very damaged by earthquakes. Tacitus uh, writes about that in the second century, drawing on first century documents. And also the Sibylline oracles um, mention earthquakes. And both of those um, <clears throat> works mention the, um, uh, the, the problems at Laodicea in particular. Now, Laodicea wasn't very far from Colossae. In fact, it's only about 18 kilometres away. So if, if there were devastating earthquakes uh, at Laodicea, they were devastating earthquakes at Colossae as well. But perhaps um, because Laodicea was more, had more monumental buildings, um, the, you know, the, the destruction of the earthquake may have been greater uh, at Laodicea than at Colossae. But certainly for me, that is uh, an important context to consider. Here, uh, if you have a look at the screen, um, you'll see that this part of Asia Minor is depicted. And um, in this circle here, we have uh, uh, Colossae and Laodicea and Hierapolis in, that, in a little triangle in this part of the Lycus Valley. The Lycus, of course, is a river. And um, the two largest cities, Laodicea and Hierapolis, um, are well known and also being excavated today. Um, Colossae was somewhat smaller, though not an insignificant city, uh, and it did um, sit on the trade route from Ephesus over here uh, across to, uh, to the east. So um, that in itself would have made it an important um, uh, place in, in, that, um, in that region. Colossians, I understand, to be a kind of circular letter. Now, um, we, we see uh, in chapter 4, verse, particularly verse 16, that uh, Paul and Timothy uh, ask the recipients, the Colossians, to in, to, in this way. They say, and when this letter has been read among you, have it read also in the church of the Laodiceans, 
and see that you read also the letter from Laodicea. So this is a letter uh, written by people at a distance in Rome uh, to uh, people in, uh, in Asia Minor, in the Lycus Valley, people whom they don't know personally, but whom they know through Epaphras. And they are uh, writing to those believers and asking those believers to um, uh, pass this letter on to the Laodiceans and also read a letter from the Laodiceans. Now, this is a really interesting question as to what, what letter is this talking about? Uh, you might be aware that um, the New American Standard Bible is often the most literal uh, Bible, uh, and, uh, but in this case it adds a number of words that are simply not there. It adds the words, my letter, that is the, uh, from Laodicea, or my letter to Laodicea. It doesn't say that in the Greek. The Greek simply says, um, see that you read the letter from Laodicea. And of course, this implies that there was a letter from Laodicea that went to Rome and that Paul and Timothy and the team in Rome um, considered as they were writing Colossians. And then they sent um, the, the letter bearers, Tychicus and Onesimus, back to, um, to Asia Minor and asked them to read out the letter to the Colossians, which included this little um, uh, uh, verse at the end of it, saying that they are to now read the letter from the Laodiceans. Now, I don't uh, discuss this, um, this aspect of it in great detail in the commentary, but I've subsequently written about that and that, that will be uh, appearing, um, in, I don't know, in the next few months. And so for me, this is an important strategy that that uh, Paul and Timothy and their team have of fostering some um, reconnection between the Laodiceans and the Colossians. And that does, uh, at least to me, imply quite strongly that there's been some sort of breakdown of, of that uh, close connection um, in, in recent times. So I see the occasion of the letter in this way. I see that the, it's, it's written post um, the earthquakes. Now I'm, I'm saying plural because generally speaking um, you don't just have one earthquake, you have more than one and, and certainly there does seem to be evidence that there may have been one in 64 as well as uh, in, in the year 60. Um, it's, um, it seems that Archippus has been sent on a mission from the, the Pauline team in Rome to, uh, uh, to the Lycus Valley because he is exhorted uh, right at the end of the letter uh, in this way. It says, see that you complete the task that you have received in the Lord. And uh, I find that quite striking because normally you'd think that Paul and his associates would send greetings to Archippus. Uh, they send greetings to Nympha. They send greetings to all the Colossians. There aren't explicit greetings here. It's just a, um, an exhortation or even a command that Archippus is to complete the task that he has uh, received in the Lord. And so um, uh, we know that Archippus in, in the letter to Philemon was um, described as a fellow soldier and he was with um, uh, Philemon and Aphia and the household. And, and so uh, as I understand it, um, uh, Archippus has gone uh, and, and with a particular task into this context, possibly uh, to bring help and assistance um, to the, um, the people of the Lycus, the believers of the Lycus Valley in the wake of the earthquakes. Um, uh, another purpose of the letter is, of course, to confirm and re-establish the Pauline leadership and network. Um, and also uh, in the face of general pressures on the new believing community who, who are without their leaders. And of course, uh, without... Um, uh, mature leadership, they would be attracted to various things. And, uh, and that's the sort of thing that we see in chapter two of Colossians. So the dating that I um, argue for of this letter is um, uh, 62. And uh, as I say, a couple of years after Philemon, which I date around the year 60. 
Right, so that's the end of the first section. Are there any comments or questions that you'd like to raise? Brilliant, thank you so much, Vicky. Um, friends, if you're listening, the chat box is open for you to uh, register your question. So if you've been listening to Vicky, just uh, walk us through uh, the overview of the letter, the socio-historical context, and the occasion and date of the letter, and if a question burning uh, in your mind, you're free to uh, just engage the chat box and type your question there, and um, I'm sure she'll be more than willing to um, uh, respond to the question. If you have speaking rights, you're more than welcome to, to uh, unmute and pose your question, um, but keep it brief so that uh, we will transition to the next, se next section uh, in the uh, in, in time. Um, Vicky, you have done so well in just painting the picture of what was, how the letter is related to Philemon and how the letter may have been written or was written. And um, uh, I'm interested to know, to, to zoom in on um, the person of Achipas because you mentioned something that um, I've been looking into recently. So Achipas being described as a sustratiotes, uh, a fellow soldier. And that term doesn't occur frequently in the New Testament. It only occurs in Philippians. And here we hear of the soldier, but not sustratiotes as fellow soldier. Uh, do you have any insight to why Paul would call somebody a fellow soldier when they are working for Jesus, uh, why use this military metaphor or military language mm -hmm. to describe Achipas? Any thoughts in that direction? Thank you for that question. It's a great question. Um, I do uh, speculate a little bit about the different titles in, in the commentary. And in particular, um, I, I see a, a fellow soldier as, as somebody who can be deployed. And, and so uh, this is a, um, a kind of missionary position of somebody who is is free to move out from um, uh, from the local network and go and do something in particular. So that that's that's my kind of um, working hypothesis. But in fact, I'd be very interested to hear what you think and whether your your research is um, uh, coming up with other aspects of that. Yeah, I, I do see the deployment component. So thanks for your answer. I do see the deployment component. And uh, I do think when we speak of Achifas as fellow soldier, uh, there's a dynamic to which is a designated deployment. Uh, so, uh, and there's a point to which he is owned uh, by the church and he doesn't have freedom, so to speak, such that even when Paul says, um, when Paul and Timothy say to Achipas in, in 4.17, see to me that you do, uh, that comes across as a, a commander speaking to uh, an inferior uh, soldier, so to speak, rank-wise. Ego, uh, I think the language of military, uh, i.e. fellow soldier, shapes the relationship of deployment, which I agree with you on, but also the readiness with which Achipas should uh, obey the command or injunction. So, yeah, that's that, that's my line of reasoning. But um, mm. it'd be interesting to have a conversation on that. Well, that's right, and 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 perhaps that is also the reason that at the end of Colossians we don't get um, a sort of a, a general uh, um, warm greeting, but but a kind of a, something. Slightly like a rebuke. Um, that, that's how I read uh, Colossians four seventeen. Uh, that that uh, this is quite this is um, a little bit sharp, and it's also by by articulating it in the letter, it's also making it public and saying and 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 co opting not only the Colossians but also also the Laodiceans to help see that that Archippus does this task, and so. Um, yeah, there's a little bit of an edge of uh, perhaps Archippus. Certainly, my, my my sense of it is that they were expecting Archippus to have finished that task by now, and um, and they were expecting him to have returned with a report, uh, and he hasn't yet. And and so, um, they they are keen to um, encourage him uh, to to do that, to get back and and uh, and report him encourage him in the lord uh, there's a there's a question in the chat box uh from uh 
Dare Jere. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. And if I'm not, my apologies. And there's a question related to Ephesians and Colossians. And it is, is it possible that the letter from Laodicea is the epistle to the Ephesians? I'm sure you can handle this one. Over to you. Mm. Thank you for that question. That is often the uh, position that scholars have taken. So uh, here I'm going out a little bit on a limb uh, and saying, uh, I don't think that the letter to the Ephesians is that letter. But certainly, uh, traditionally, uh, that letter has been understood in that way in various scholarly contexts. So um, for me, I think uh, uh, that letter is a letter we don't have the letter that's mentioned here um, uh, in, in verse 16, it's a letter that I find it very interesting that, um, that Paul and Timothy first want Col the Colossians to hear the, their letter, which is a very um, honorific letter of them. They're, they are the smaller community. They're not really, in terms of a pecking order, you'd think that um, uh, that Paul and Timothy would have written first to perhaps Laodicea. But no, they've written uh, to Col the Colossians first and they've had this very um, uh, wonderful letter uh, which, which encourages them to remember uh, uh, um, how to live in Christ and the virtues that come along with that and the sort of attitudes that one should cultivate. And then only after that... Uh, do they then say, and now let's hear the letter from Laodicea. And I'm, I'm assuming that that letter may have said, look, we are really, um, you know, suffering and maybe the Colossians are not helping us enough or, you know, there, there might have been some critical uh, comments in that letter. And by having um, the Colossian letter read first and then um, the, uh, the letter from Laodicea via Paul and Timothy, uh, they would have heard that in a different light. So that it seems to me, if that's the case, uh, that is a, a very um, pastoral strategy for um, reconnecting these communities that were quite closely connected, but were also rivals. When we see the relationship between Laodicea and Herapolis and Colossae, we see a lot of um, cultivation of rivalry as well so that that's how i see it but i do know that other scholars see it quite differently thanks so much vicky um there's a question from jill golvin uh jill you have speaking rights so over to you oh thank you um i think i may be jumping the gun here but i also didn't want to lose the opportunity um uh, vicky so is it the appropriate point to discuss verse um, 18 in the last verse? Sure, yes. Great, okay, I wasn't sure, maybe you're gonna cover it later. Thanks so much. Oh, oh would you like me to, oh, I, saw, I, th I thought you'd like to say sorry, something about sorry, it. Um, that. The yes. question was just about that specific claim in 418 that Paul makes about writing the letter with his own hand. I was just interested to know your take on that um, with reference to what you said about Timothy being the um, actual author, although, mm. you know, it sounded like it would be him and Paul together. Mm. Thank you, yes. Um, look, I, I do think that uh, I see verse, uh, verse 18 as genuinely written by the hand of Paul, and that actually then becomes, as you know, in other Pauline letters, a kind of mark of Paul and, uh, and, a, and a, um, uh, something of a, you know, the, the um, hallmark of, of genuine Pauline letters. Uh, but yes, I, I see that the, uh, the, Pauline, the Pauline writing is particularly uh, obvious at the beginning and at the end of this letter, and that Timothy largely um, shapes the rest of the letter, although the the Pauline perspective is quite strong at certain other points in the letter as well. The reason that I, um, and I'll say a little bit more about this in a minute, the reason that I do think that P Timothy is um, involved uh, largely uh, in, in writing the letter itself is that the style is quite distinctive when you compare it with the undisputed letters. And, um, and so I think that 
it's um yeah scholars say that grammatically you know people have quite a bit of a, a thumbprint of how uh, how they write in terms of their grammar and this doesn't seem to be um uh, undisputed paul in terms of the the style in 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 much of this letter but the beginning and the ending i, I do think that there's no um no reason to think that paul uh, wasn't there the, the other thing that's at stake here is that um I think that Paul was a, a, a real team player. And I think that Paul would have allowed Timothy, who was indeed one of his, well, his 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 son, as he talks about in, in Philippians, but also one of his oldest co-workers, because we we know that Paul and was working with Timothy even before uh, the very earliest letter of the uh, of the Pauline corpus, uh, namely 1 Thessalonians. Um, already that they were working together. So Paul would have entrusted Timothy with, with a lot of work. And I don't think that Paul could have um, achieved the sort of networking that he did if he was micromanaging everything. Uh, you know, I think that he did allow his co-workers to do substantial things and, in fact, um, uh, at times draft aspects of the letters. Um, of course, under his, you know, oversight but um but not in a way that that stops the letter having some distinctive theology as well it has more of a um a, a realized eschatology than a future one for instance um and so anyway th there are lots of reasons and I'll, I'll say a bit more about that in the next section um uh, so perhaps i should stop there without waxing too lyrical um thanks, thanks so, so much, much Ricky. Um, yeah <laughs> and thanks jill for the question and the communal aspect of letter writing in the ancient world is something that's very important in the Pauline circles and that Paul does not write alone, uh, yet he supervises certain writings and they are contributions even from slaves. Uh, we hear one slave chiming in at the end of Romans and look, I'm here. And it's quite, uh, it's quite cheeky and interesting, but Paul is there and his influence. So the I write this with my own hand appears in it appears in um, Philemon also, uh, but you have a list of people who are there as Paul is writing and they are listed even at the end. So there is that to consider also. But thanks so much for uh, responding to that question. I think we'll take one more and then transition to uh, the next uh, section, uh, uh, Vicky. Uh, there is a question from Namond Jali, which we will bank for later. I think this one is in line with uh, the uh, discussion in the third phase. Um, there's a question here from uh, and the question is when comparing the prayers of Paul in Ephesians chapter 1 and 3 with a prayer in Colossians in chapter 1 are they not from the same author I think um, you can attend to this one or uh, we can bank it for later it's up to you Vicky just very briefly on that thank you for that question um, I do think that they are very similar uh, uh, Ephesians and Colossians um, have many similarities and many uh, scholars who've worked on both of them think that Colossians is the earlier uh, version and Ephesians is the um, later and expanded version of um, a very similar vision. And so, um, yes, uh, I think that uh, it's, it's quite likely that the authorship is, is similar, if not the same. Thank you so much for that uh, response. We are going to transition now to section two, and I will hand over to a esteemed speaker to walk us through the themes of how the letter compares to the Greco-Roman philosophical traditions, the letter's key literary features, and major scholarly debates linked to the letter. We've covered some of them, um, but uh, we are in capable hands today. Hey, Vicky, over to you. Thank you. All right. So. Uh, I'm going to begin with the, some literary features, um, a word or two about scholarly debates, and then move on into the, the Greco-Roman philosophy. The, uh, the literary style, as I mentioned, uh, does differ from uh, undisputed Pauline letters. There's uh, an important study from the 1970s uh, by uh, Walter Bouillard. Um, as you can see, there's still analytische Untersuchungen zum Kolossebrief. Uh, which demonstrates uh, a number of things about Colossians, and this has been very influential in Colossian studies. Uh, first of all, that um, there are substantially fewer conjunctions 
than in Paul's undisputed letters. Second, um, there are uh, more relative clauses and relative pronouns. So this is a much more um, um, intricate grammatical um, construction uh, than, um, than the style of Paul's undisputed letters. And also alongside this, there are some distinctive theological and rhetorical nuances in Colossians vis-a-vis -vis, um, the undisputed letters. So this has been quite, as I say, influential in, um, in thinking about Colossians. One of the literary features uh, that, um, that we've kind of been alluding to, but we haven't named it uh, as such yet, is uh, this uh, phenomenon of playerophory um, or being filled full. Um, the, the Thanksgiving letter, the, the Thanksgiving at the beginning of, uh, of the letter, in um, particularly verses 9 to 14, and in fact onwards right until verse 22, because it's one long sentence in the Greek, um, all of those um, verses are dependent on the main verb there, uh, that you may be filled full. Uh, so here, if you, I'll just read a little section here. Therefore, we also have not stopped praying for you from the day we heard about you. We are asking that you may be filled full with the knowledge of God's will in all wisdom and spiritual insight to live your lives worthily in every way, desiring to please the Lord in every good work, bearing fruit and increasing in the knowledge of God in every capability, being empowered according to his glorious strength for all steadfast endurance and patience. So you can see um, the emphases there show just how much there's all things and everything um, are being emphasised in this construction. Now these, these are only three verses of this long expanse of one sentence. And that's unusual. That, that is not uh, what we normally find in the Pauline writings, except of course in, in Ephesians, as, as uh, the uh, previous um, comment uh, mentioned. So this uh, rhetorical phenomenon uh, is a style that emphasizes the use of synonyms, so knowledge, wisdom, insight, cognates, being empowered with all power, genitive attributes like the strength of his glory, and this frequent use of the word pass, all or every. So this phenomenon of playerophory is a verbal depiction of abundant fullness. So this is a way of, it's, it, it's very um, uh, akin to prayer and, uh, and may well um, reflect the kind of prayer life of the community. And, uh, and, and so it's trying to capture in words what is kind of ineffable, what's quite, it, what's, you know, you can't really um, pin it down with words, but, but nevertheless they're in, endeavouring to, to speak of these mysteries in words. And so um, that, that's, I think, a very distinctive style that we find here at the beginning of Colossians and also in Ephesians. Now, I just want to say a couple of words about a couple of scholarly debates. Um, first of all, um, the question of what prompted the letter, the writing of the letter. I've set out my occasion uh, for the letter, but um, not all scholars agree with me. Uh, Many scholars uh, look and, and wonder, were the Colossians succumbing to pressures of false teaching and heresy? So many scholars, uh, I think, take their lead or um, their, the orientation of, of how they're going to read the letter from chapter two. And chapter two, of course, is uh, where Paul and Timothy are talking about certain pressures that the uh, community are under. So the whole question of the Colossian problem uh, is, is raised there. And uh, the Colossian problem is often seen as an influx of false teachers leading the Colossians to seek to supplement their faith in Christ with another type of religious experience or set of practices. So the letter emphasizes the universal scope of Christ and Christ's work. In particular, a scholar, a very fine scholar by the name of Clinton Arnold, uh, has written uh, The Colossian Syncretism, The Interface Between Christianity and Folk Belief at Colossi. And um, 
uh, I think that's a reprint of an earlier, I think he did it first in 1996. And he draws on evidence of angel inscriptions and magical texts and archaeological evidence from Asia Minor to argue that um, the problem at Colossae was um, that they were combining Paul's teaching about Christ with local, local pagan and local Jewish folk beliefs. All right, so that's one of the um, one of the main, uh, uh, I guess, approaches that that scholars take, um, endeavouring to kind of uh, tie down and research the Colossian problem. Another uh, area of scholarly debate is one I've already mentioned, namely that not everybody sees this as written by Paul. Uh, they see it um, more as pseudepigraphy. And, uh, and, uh, and I'd say that most European scholars fall into this category based on, particularly on Bouillard's um, stylistic analysis and also on the conviction that Colossi had been destroyed by the earthquakes that I mentioned and that it was no longer inhabited. So if you have a, a Pauline letter written in the 60s, it could not, um, in, you know, historically speaking, be going to Colossi because there was no one living there anymore. That's the um, scholarly position. Um, I think that uh, that latter uh, notion that no one was at Colossi anymore has, has I think, now been debunked uh, because uh, my colleague, Australian colleague, um, Alan Cadwallader, has uh, um, uh, found evidence of inscriptions and um, that, that show that people were re rebuilding Col uh, Colossi uh, after the earthquakes. Uh, into the late first century and beyond. So it's, it's not as though people up and left, um, even though that the devastation must have been very difficult. Another um, area of, of scholarly debate is um, the household code here. And we have um, what's probably the, the earliest of our household codes in the New Testament in Colossians chapter 3. Um, and that also uh, is seen to distinguish the letter from the undisputed letters of Paul. And so um, on those um, grounds, many scholars, uh, yeah, many scholars that see this as not a genuine Pauline letter, but a Deutero-Pauline letter. I've said already why I don't take that position. Uh, I think that it, um, there are a number of uh, Scott, it's, it's not as though I'm the only one arguing this um, uh, co-authorship uh, position. There are a number of scholars that are also arguing that. Um, and uh, it seems to me that um, it, it, it accounts for all the different aspects of the letter um, better than a notion that Paul was no longer uh, alive. And um, uh, yeah. I think that Timothy uh, was, in fact, um, actively involved in drafting it and the letter. Now, I want to say some words about uh, the Stoic background. And this, is, has, of course, has been a key aspect of the work that I've done in the Earth Bible Commentary. Stoic ideas were really widespread and popular in the first century. Uh, they were... I argue, the cultural and ethical soil in which evangelists could plant the seed of a gospel of a Christ who died for others and who rose again from the dead. Interestingly, against a Stoic background, pagans could comprehend such a gospel due to Stoicism, and that means that not all pagans who became um, believers did so via the synagogue. It's not as though they all became God-fearers and then as God-fearers, then they became believers. No, they actually came directly from paganism because many of the values of Stoicism were um, uh, mirrored in the gospel, but there were some key things about the gospel that went beyond Stoicism. So in my commentary, I argue Stoic ideas were central in the reception of the gospel among pagans. And um, this is especially so among pagans who were not associated with the Jewish synagogues in the diaspora. Now, a scholar by the name of David Harm 
back in the 70s, long time ago now, um, uh, made the point that, uh, that Stoicism was widely spread. He says more people in the Mediterranean world would have held a more or less Stoic conception of the world than any other from the third century BCE to the second century CE. Stoicism was very likely the most widely accepted worldview in the Western world, and it appealed to all classes, attracting slaves and labourers, as well as kings and emperors. It, its ideals infiltrated religion and science, medicine and theology, poetry and drama, law and government. Now, this idea that Stoicism was widely spread, the most widely spread philosophy of the day, is widely accepted in philosophical circles. That is to say, if you go into a philosophy department and say, Stoicism was the most popular um, philosophy in Asia Minor in the first century, nobody will bat an eyelid, they'll go, yeah, sure. Um, but if you say that in, in New Testament circles, if people go, oh, no, no, no that's not, that can't be right. It was definitely Platonism or something. So um, I think it's interesting when we, when we read the letter against the background of a different philo philosophical system, we notice different things. And that's what I'm trying to do in the commentary. I argue that Stoic ideas form a foundation for understanding the per person and work of Christ. So let me say a few words about what they are, because they're not particularly well known. Of course, um, really a very, maybe only 1% of Stoic writings that existed in the first century are still extant. So it's quite, quite hard to get a sense of how widely spread they were and exactly what they were. But anyway, um, here I distill uh, about 12 uh, key ideas briefly. Uh, first of all, the Logos was very important, the Logos reason. They understood the Logos um, as the, uh, the principle that animated the world. The world is an organic whole animated and directed by reason, by Logos. The cosmos is permeated by the Logos. Uh, which is variously described as the world's soul, commanding faculty, and spirit or breath, pneuma. So you can see, uh, of course, in, in, uh, in our New Testament, we know Logos very well from the opening of John's Gospel. I think Colossians uses it a little bit differently, but I think nevertheless that um, it's likely that John's Gospel comes also from this um, uh, area of Asia Minor, uh, the area of Ephesus, and, and Logos was widely spread and, and, and widely known. Second, uh, God was known through nature, according to Stoicism. God uh, was, is the ultimate cause of all things and is known through nature, physis, and, and so Stoics, various Stoics talk about God and nature somewhat interchangeably. The world is through and through providential, providing humanity and all creatures with all that we need for a good life. So that's kind of a bit similar to um, a Christian idea, isn't it? That, that God is a good God, that God made the world good and, and loves the world. The third idea of Stoicism is that uh, we are to live in harmony with nature. The true goal of humanity is an active life in harmony with nature. And this follows, um, uh, it follows that cultivating harmony with nature gives peace of mind. And here's a little quote by um, Stabaeus, who's one of the people who talks about Stoicism. Of course, as I, as I mentioned, we don't have um, the writings of Zeno anymore, uh, who was the founder of Stoicism. What we have is Steno as, as um, uh, reported by, by others. So Zeno represented this goal as living in agreement this is living in, in accordance with one concordant reason, Logos, since those who live in conflict are unhappy. His successors express this in a more expanded form, living in agreement with nature. And so if, if nature and God are seen to be very closely aligned, then one is one's, um, the purpose of uh, uh, happiness, I guess, is, is achieved by living in accordance with nature and so with God. The fourth thing that they, is distinctive about them is that they, they emphasise the interconnectedness of all things. You might know the quote, the quote by Marcus Aurelius, who's of course a little bit later than, 
than the first century. He's a second century emperor. Uh, he, he put it very poetically, all that is in tune with thee, O universe, is in tune with me. Nothing that is due time for thee is too early or too late for me. All that thy seasons bring, O nature, is fruit for me. All things come from thee, subsist in thee, go back to thee. And you can um, hear perhaps uh, a bit of a resonance with uh, the report in Act 17 of Paul uh, with the philosoph philosophers on the Areopagus. And, um, and he talks about in, in God we live and move and have our being. So in, in many ways, very similar sort of concept that within, uh, within God uh, we, we live. A fifth point, uh, Stoicism is non-dualistic. Now, this is different from Platonic ideas. Stoics rejected dualism and, and they rejected Plato's theory of ideas, which, um, as you know, uh, re thinks of reality as a kind of, we experience a shadow of the true reality, which is at great distance and above us. Um, so the key difference between Platonic and Stoic cosmology is that Stoic cosmology sees the spirit, the divine, permeating all reality. And this is a contrast with Platonic thought, which sees the divine at a distance from this world. To use our modern theological terms, they emphasised the imminence of God. Stoics emphasised the imminence, not the transcendence, although I think transcendence was there as well. But it's a different uh, view than um, uh, Platonic uh, philosophy. Then the sixth point, uh, they, they thought about um, everything that's important is embodied. So in, incarnation comes uh, into this field. Stoic logic deduce, deduced that for something to exist, it must be capable of producing or experiencing some change. And they argued that this condition is only met by bodies or matter. Now, of course, what they meant by um, matter is, is not um, quite the same as what we mean by matter. Uh, therefore, Stoics um, thought that nature and God are embodied. They thought of God as, in a sense, uh, a spiritual embodied um, uh, being. The type of embodiment is similar to the spiritual bodies, which Paul writes about in 1 Corinthians 15, 44 to 54. And, um, and if you're interested in this, uh, the scholar uh, by the name of Trolls Engbu Pedersen has written a lot about how Paul and Stoic thought uh, are very close. So this is not me inventing it from scratch. This is me picking up on some ideas and, and taking them in certain directions. Now, this, the seventh point, um, Stoics saw that it was necessary to have a conversion to virtue or altruism. The Stoics believed that one needed to undergo a profound change from being a self-interested person to, to one that's virtuous and altruistic. And this is all about um, uh, being brought, uh, well, being brought to, to, to connect with the logos, reason. Um, uh, and, and so this is very similar, and this is what uh, Engberg Pedersen argues as well, very similar to a kind of co the conversion that the Christian uh, uh, gospel was, was calling uh, for as well. They, uh, Stoics thought about happiness, eudaimonia, uh, as benefiting others. And so um, uh, the goal of these things is to be useful, to be to benefit others. Seneca put it this way, no school has more goodness and gentleness, none has more love for human beings, nor more attention to the common good than Stoicism. The goal which it assigns to us is to be useful, to help others and to take care, not only of ourselves, but of everyone in general and of each one in particular. So you can see, again, a very uh, close connection with the gospel. Stoics, um, particularly in the first century, were known uh, at, um, uh, for their um, ethical reflection and their emphasis on wisdom, and in particular for training in virtue. So this was um, something that, uh, that was emphasised. Then the, uh, number 10, gladness and gratitude. Um, this is also a quote from Seneca. Um, this is 
um, yeah, he says, let us go to sleep with joy and gladness. Let us say, I have lived. The course which fortune set for me is finished. And if God is pleased to add another day, we should welcome it with glad hearts. That man is happiest and is secure in his own possession of himself, who can await the morrow without apprehension. When a man has said, I have lived, every morning he arises, he receives a bonus. So again, um, uh, cultivating an attitude of thankfulness is an aspect of Stoic uh, philosophy. And again, this is very similar to the Gospel. Now, Stoics, Stoics are mostly known for their attitude to suffering, aren't they? And, uh, and so I've left that till later in my, um, in my list. But, uh, but certainly, um, they had a distinctive attitude to suffering. Stoic ethics emphasised that some things are under our control and other things are not. The distinction is crucial because uh, we can master all those things that are under our control. All the other things that are outside our control do not ultimately define us. And this is an important idea for, for Stoics, that they said, well, the things that I can control, I can change. The things that happen to me, um, uh, many things are outside my control and they um, I will not allow them to, to shape me to determine who I am. And, and so that leads into this final uh, point about some things are non-essential. They are a diaphoria. So the criterion of happiness and a good life is virtue. While we naturally prefer some things and not others, we prefer health, not illness, comfort, not poverty. These preferences are not essential, according to the Stoics, to a happy life. They are, in fact, a diaphoria, indifferent or non-essential. Now, if you have a look at Paul's writings, he has quite a lot of similarities, even with this particular point, um, where he, he says, you know, I can be full, I can be empty, <clears throat> I can have everything, I can have nothing, uh, because, you know, the gospel is, is that um, the, the essential thing and all these other things are ultimately non-essential. Now, there are some key differences uh, between Stoic ideas and the gospel. Um, one of them is eschatology. Um, many Stoics believed that uh, there was this sort of cyclical um, uh, reality and that after the, the, um, the cosmos ends in fire, in a conflagration, the, the new cosmos is formed and everything's exactly the same. So there's no essential escape from this cycle. No room for hoping for something better. And so ultimately hope is a really crucial difference between Stoic ideas and the gospel. Now, when we understand Colossians against a Stoic background, it, it not only highlights certain things, it actually allows itself to be understood, I argue, um, better in, in certain ways than against a Platonic one. That there's the positive valuing of all things as created through Christ and for Christ, and all things being sustained in Christ. So the world is now not um, imminently passing away, according to Colossians, but when we look at um, Colossians 1, 15 to 20, we see um, the way in which all things come into being through Christ, and in, in Christ all things are sustained. All things hold together in verse 17. Now, in terms of uh, the Colossian uh, gospel, Jesus Christ was proclaimed in uh, terms that connect in with Stoic ideas. Christ was proclaimed as the invisible embodiment of the invisible God, the one in whom wisdom or spirit was fully present, the one who was ultimately useful for, for others, namely the one who was crucified for the sake of sinners, Christ is proclaimed as the cosmic Christ, the one in whom all things are created, sustained and reconciled. So it's very striking um, that when we, we, when we read the Christology that we find in Colossians, it does um, uh, resonate with, with this idea of the divine, the logos permeating reality. We see that Christ permeates reality reality 
or all reality is connected and sustained in Christ. Uh, in particular, when we read a verse like uh, Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, which says, For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. The whole fullness of deity dwells currently uh, bodily. That's right, in bodily form. And uh, so notice bodily, that's uh, very, very stoic, not neg negative about body. Um, all the fullness, again, that's the, um, the kind of interest in um, the uh, pleroma, uh, which is mentioned here in Colossians, and um, currently lives in, a, in an ongoing way. So this is not just talking about Christ's incarnation in the flesh during his earthly life, but but in, in an ongoing way. Platonic ideas were at, you know, contrasting the mind, um, the intellect and the spiritual level and, and the heavens with the, the lower earthly things, the matter, the senses, the material, and the earth. And that leads to a kind of a dualistic view of reality. But the Stoics were not dualistic. As I mentioned, they re re rejected dualism and um, and saw uh, the world as much more interconnected. So they saw the spirit, as I mentioned, uh, permeating all reality, and that's a contrast with Platonic thought, which sees the divine at a distance from this world. As I mentioned, uh, Stoics uh, thought that everything that had power to affect other things uh, was embodied. And that means that ultimately God is understood to be embodied as well. So it's not a, oh, I might just go back to that previous slide. So it's not a difficult move for, um, for people schooled in Stoic thought to think of the, um, uh, the deity, the, the God, the invisible um, God to be incarnate in the person of Jesus Christ, because that same logos, that same spirit, um, was not only uh, permeating reality, but was ultimately um, fully embodied in the human person of Jesus. So they, they don't find that kind of move from the universal to the, to the particular um, nearly as difficult as, um, as, as often uh, we do. We do see some um, uh, hints at Stoicism in the New Testament. I mentioned uh, Acts 17 already. In God we live and move and have our being. That's a particularly Stoic idea. And also if you read that, um, that account in, in uh, Acts 17, it's um, the Stoics and the Epicureans are the ones that are, are, are the key dialogue partners. Uh, uh, Platonic philosophers are not mentioned uh, in that chapter. And I mentioned also that Paul writes about spiritual bodies in 1 Corinthians 15. The so-called Colossians hymn, which is chapter 1, verses 15 to 20, has a number of these things. So I just want to very briefly mention them um, uh, in verse 16. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created. So this is, um, if, if we think of Christ as being identified with the Logos, um, which permeates reality and um, is the kind of, uh, I guess, um, means whereby God creates all things. Um, in Christ, all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible. In him, all things hold together. So Christ is... Um, enabling the whole cosmos to, to be sustained um, rather than um, saying that all things are passing, or, you know, the world is passing away imminently. And then in verse 19, in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. So again, that how could um, uh, in Christ the whole fullness of God dwell in this one person? Well, for, for Stokes that wasn't, wasn't a problem. All right, so there, let me pause there for um, questions and comments. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Vicky, for walking us through uh, 
comparable traditions uh, in the Greco-Roman world that may have influenced uh, uh, Paul and Timothy's letter to the Colossians. And uh, I have a recommendation to make. Uh, as you were listening to the second section, you may have wondered, how can I get more information around Stoicism, Platonism, and even uh, other, or Epicureanism? And I would say if you are wanting to delve deeper in that direction, I have a couple of books to recommend here. And one of them is Paul and the Giants of Philosophy. This book came out last year, and it's a series of very accessible essays that document that. So Paul and the Giants of Philosophy are uh, edited by um, Dotson and Brions uh, in the foreword by John Barclay. So Paul and the Giants of Philosophy, very accessible. And this book is based on this book, uh, which TNT Clark produced a few years ago. So this is Paul and the Greco-Roman Philosophical Tradition. Paul, Paul and the Greco-Roman Philosophical uh, Tradition. Again, uh, edited by uh, Joseph Dotson and Andrew Pitts, uh, very, very good scholars uh, there. So these two books can be your conversation partners should you want to get into the world of um, Greco-Roman philosophy and how it affected or influenced the writing of our Pauline letters. Vicky, thank you so much for opening uh, this section for us. As always, friends, please feel free to engage the chat box, uh, type in your question, uh, and we'll have some discussion going. Vicky, I have a quick one for you uh, regarding uh, Stoicism and its view of slaves. So we have different uh, uh, views of individuals uh, in the ancient world, and slaves are regarded as those who are fated to be such. It's only later with Seneca that we hear him being sympathetic and even ameliorating the position of slaves. Would you like to comment in that direction and how that affects the household codes and how the household is regarded uh, from early Stoicism to later, if you want? Over to you. Mm, thank you. Um... So the, the Stoics believed uh, that they had a concept that, that's called oikiosis, um, which is related, of course, to the oikos, the house. Um, and uh, it's a notion of, uh, of framing one's kinship network and drawing people uh, closer in. And uh, they, did, they did have a kind of um, something of a utopian ideal about the fact that um, we don't need the kind of um, distinctions between slave and free uh, that that was so common that were just basically the, the, the world in which in which they lived and uh, and so we do see um, slaves uh, becoming quite uh, certain slaves becoming quite significant such as Epictetus who was a very famous um, slave former slave who uh, became a, a stoic philosopher and teacher and um, uh, he, it's interesting when you read his writings, he, he uh, with his, his class of elite, um, presumably young men, um, he, he, uh, he challenges them about, you know, being slaves themselves. And, uh, and, and so in many ways, it becomes a kind of um, topos, not unlike the way Paul uses the word slave, because of course, Paul in Colossians and elsewhere, um, talks of himself as a slave of Christ. And he has fellow slaves um, as part of his team. And it's really an honorific title for Paul, I think. Um, uh, I don't know that um, Epictetus uses it honorifically, but he, um, but he does uh, see people as enslaved to their passions and that they need to be freed. So, um, yeah, there were, uh, I don't know in practice whether the, the Stoics um, often um, manumitted their slaves more more quickly than others. Uh, I, I suspect probably not, but uh, but they certainly uh, undertook to to view um, all people um, irrespective of their kind of um, rank and status uh, in, in a more um, I guess a hum humane way. Um, so you, you mentioned um, Seneca, and uh, sorry, I've forgotten the, that part of the, the question. Oh, the, you mentioned the household codes. That's right. Um, yes. it, it would have been, I think, not only for Stoics, but also for the early Christians, it must have been difficult. Well, we see how difficult it was in, in relation to Onesimus and, and Philemon and how Paul 
manages that so brilliantly, uh, writing this very fascinating letter to, to Philemon uh, to essentially ask him to manumit Onesimus without asking him. Um, and, uh, and I think that uh, it, it would have been difficult for someone like, for instance, like Nympho, who's the head of a household, she's a, um, obviously a Greco-Roman elite woman, and, uh, and she would have relied on having slaves and to, to you know, run her household. And it must have been difficult uh, as she became a Christian and presumably her whole household became Christians uh, to, to, to say, you, you slaves are my brothers and sisters, but you're still my slaves as well. Um, you, you need to keep doing your job. Um, it, it, that must have been a difficult thing. And I think that the household code has one of the, that's one of its functions uh, to, to try and encourage the slaves to to see their position not as an ultimate um, thing, but, you know, because everyone ultimately has a master, namely God, but to nevertheless uh, carry on with their work. Anyway, there's some thoughts. <laughs> Thank you so much for that, Vicky. Um, very, very good responses there. I see uh, we have Temba and Google to typing in, or Gladys rather, Temba and Gladys typing in the chat box. So I'll wait um, a, few, a couple of moments uh, just to get your questions um, before we transition to uh, the next uh, uh, round of questions. I'll see David Woods. Dave, uh, over to you. Uh, you have speaking rights, so please feel free to unmute and speak, and then uh, we'll move on. Over to you. Good afternoon, and thank you so much for your talk. Uh, I, I've done a little bit of work um, previously on Colossians 2, verses 16 and 17 which uh, much, or I would say most of Christian tradition um, takes as speaking against um, participating, partaking of foods and drinks and participating in <clears throat> festivals, new moons and Sabbaths. But the text actually presents it the other way around. And um, so I'd be interested in hearing your comments on that. And my the second part of this is um, to ask if you've encountered or uh, if you have an opinion on Brian Allen's work um, in which he, he re regards this um, the shadow um, not being in uh, kind of a substance reality contrast, um, it, but rather the body of Christ is always, and Paul's letters is a reference to the church as we know it. And um, so he takes it literally and uh, through interpreting Crino um, as, as to consider or to think about, reflect on, comes up with uh, what would fall into the schools of Paul within Judaism and post supersessionist reading and i'll give you his interpretation of the verse which is therefore no one is to judge you regarding food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or sabbaths things which are a shadow of what is to come but let everyone consider the body of christ so yeah thanks dave for that uh vicky if i may just pop in here a moment uh, there are two it's uh, two questions in one and we only have time for one so we we'll go for the first one your opinion on colossians 2 17 and then i would like to give space for gladys zita and Tamba. Uh, dave if you would like to type your question uh to dr uh, balabanski and uh you can pose your second question to her and for me just to be fair to uh those who are also uh, in the room so if i can ask you to respond to 17 and 18 of chapter 2 as was posed by David Woods, and then we'll transition to Gladys to help us uh, move on to the next, because we still have one more section to cover. Over to you. Mm. So the question was around your thoughts around 2, uh, 16, 17, and 18, if you want to take it from there. Over to you. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Dave, for, for those questions. Um, I'm not, uh, I don't know that I'm going to be able to, to, to concisely answer them uh, necessarily to your satisfaction. I do, I do think that these are um, I mean, part of the problem with deciding what, what they mean is, you know, does this represent uh, 
attraction attraction to the synagogue and Jewish worship and practices, or does it, you know, or is it um, attraction to uh, pagan things? And it it does the the language there does seem to to take us in perhaps in both uh, both directions. Um, I I do think that uh, my position that I take in this in my reading of of the letter is that uh, that these are well-known problems that are confronting various communities, uh, both going in one direction and another, because they um, the, the uh, new believers were seeking to uh, supplement their, um, you know, the change of practices for, out of paganism um, by, by their sort of gravitating towards, uh, towards synagogue uh, practices and also ascetic practices. And uh, but uh, the way I read it is that uh, these are not currently happening, but but named as problems that could well be happening as far as the the team in Rome knows, and and so they they want Tychicus and Anisimus to kind of customize the letter when they when they read it out uh, to to whatever uh, the, the particular issues are that are going on in those communities. So I don't. Um, uh, I'd be interested to hear more about how you read those verses, um, and obviously I have um, a section on on those um, on those verses myself in the in the commentary. But I won't I won't uh, at this stage read them out. But thank you for for, for that question. Brilliant, Dave. Uh, we will give you uh, Dr. Balabanski's email. Uh, so for your second question, you can engage it directly should you want to do so. Uh, there is a comment from Gladys Zita Nyirongo. Uh, she expresses thanks. Thank you, Dr. Balambaski, for this clear update on this letter. Colossians is one of the books I enjoy reading or letters I enjoy reading and gives me a reason as why Jesus Christ was sent to redeem mankind uh, or humankind. It is awesome to hear you help some of us understand the position. So that's appreciation from Gladys Zita Nyirongo and then uh, from Temba as well. Uh, Vicky, I'm aware that we are racing against the clock. Please take as long as you need and we'll open up for Q&A afterwards. So don't be restricted by the clock. I will hand over to you to walk us through um, the last section um, and we will move on that way. Over to you. Thank you very much. So the last section, I just want to uh, touch on some major theological themes and also the letter's potential relevance to global South Christian communities. Yeah. So some of the themes that I think are key to understanding the letter, uh, faith, that, that Pauline triad of faith, love and hope. But here um, the emphasis is on hope rather than on love, as we, we find it in 1 Corinthians 13. But, but I think that is a distinctive Pauline triad that, um, that is uh, at use, being used in, in chapter 1 in particular. Uh, of this letter and um, and so it does seem to me that hope is a key issue and of course against a stoic background that's what was lacking in stoic um, philosophy. The second thing that I'll mention is uh, this cosmic Christology that we find in Colossians and I think that for me that's of course my entry point into um, why study this letter because uh, it, it does have um, it really emphasizes that the gospel is not just concerned about human individual salvation, although of course it is concerned about that, but, but it has a wider scope as well, namely that, that God as creator of all things uh, also cares for all things and that this creation matters to, to, to God. And, uh, and so um, Christ through whom all things were made and for whom all things were made um, uh, uh, encourages us, calls us to um, to take a stand um, uh, on the side of um, creation care. We notice that um, this letter has really the highest Christology of all New Testament writings. If you think about um, uh, the parallels with, um, say, John's Gospel, the uh, the opening. Uh, uh, prologue of John's Gospel, we have even higher Christology here when it says in, uh, in verse 16, 
that um, in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been created through him and for him. And it's that and for him that is even higher uh, Christology than, uh, than we meet in the prologue. So this is um, a, a wonderful vision of just how, how central Christ is um, in the whole scope of salvation. Then, um, uh, as I've mentioned here, valuing the creation, tapanta, um, all things, uh, is, is uh, something that I think the letter enables us to do more fully. Um, and, and valuing um, embodied reality. So uh, moving away from the notion that, uh, that Christian faith is all about um, a, de, a disembodied um, spirituality that, that doesn't need to worry about um, you know, the, the well-being of other species, other creatures. Um, I, I think that all of those things, having been created through Christ and for Christ, um, those things are valuable, they're validated uh, in this letter. The, um, and, and so the good news is, is not only good news for humanity, but for all creation as well. So in, in 1 Corinthians, um, in, in, sorry, not 1 Corinthians, in Colossians chapter 1, verse 23, no, um, yes, we, um, we read, yes, that um, the gospel has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven. And so I think about that in the, in the commentary and wonder, you know, what do we make of that? Proclaiming the, the gospel to every creature under heaven, it, that does imply that every creature under heaven, heaven um, is in need of, of um, receiving the gospel and the, the benefits of the gospel. So again, uh, that validates um, non-human uh, creation as well. The, the body of Christ is something that um, is, is very uh, prominent in this letter, and it has a, um, I guess, a shifting uh, semantic field. Uh, I think I've included some slides about that. Let me just press on to, to say a little bit more about that. So, um, yeah, in a moment. The, um, the Colossians hymn, uh, chapter 1, 15 to 20, emphasises all things. When you have a look at how often Hunter, Tampata, and Pass come up um, twice in verse 16, twice in verse 17, uh, once in verse 20, and then there's other references to all in 15, 18, and 19, 18 times just in those, those few verses. So this is a vision of, of the way in which Christ embraces um, uh, all of reality. And uh, I, I find that really um, really important and really exciting. It's also um, in the in the uh, Christ hymn of those verses, very interesting to note how um, the theology is done via prepositions. So you have in him, all things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, all things hold together in him and through him and all things are to him. Uh, and so uh, this way of doing um, theology, uh, we can call it prepositional metaphysics, is known from other writings. Uh, we know it from um, other ancient philosophies. Platonic philosophers, um, Stoics and, and Philo use prepositions in similar ways. We also find uh, the Pauline writings uh, using prepositions similarly, and we find uh, uh, that happening as well in Hebrews and in John. So I've mentioned that uh, that we have the highest Christology, but but I but I think it's very interesting to note um, that when you're trying to articulate something that's very hard to articulate, um, that uh, to 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 use these spatial categories is is very um, evocative of um, the scope of Christ's work. Uh, yes, I've mentioned this in, this important verse. Colossians 2, 9, in Christ the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And that bodiliness is, I think, really striking. And, um, and so what I think that the letter is doing is saying that 
the bodily reality of Christ is in all creation, in the church, and in the individual believer. So there's this kind of um, kind of widening circles of understanding of of Christ's presence and uh, authority. We see um, body mentioned in relation to Christ in uh, chapters one and two, the body of his flesh, his incarnate body, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily in creation, and the real body is Christ, the one through whom all things came into being. So the body of Christ is, is depicted there in various ways, the, the body of the church um, and also uh, the body of the individual believers is is um, is part of the scope of this of this um, vision. So the body of Christ, um, according to this letter, includes all creation, of course, the church, the incarnate body of Christ who died on the cross, the individual believer, and I think also, um, in some sense, the Eucharist. A friend of mine who's an artist, he, um, uh, I asked him to try and depict this. It's a bit hard to see it. In this in this slide, but um, to depict how in Christ the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. In a sense, um, it invites us to expand our vision of, of Christ, and of course we do that when we when we remember that um, we meet Christ in the face of the other. You know, we meet Christ in the suffering um, of of human beings, but we meet Christ also in creation and. Um, in uh, in suffering creation and also creation um, when it's uh, when it's flourishing, and of course we meet Christ um, sacramentally in in the Eucharist. So the, it seems to me that the body of Christ um, needs to be understood as cosmos, as community, and communion. And uh, I think uh, when we look at the, the various usages of, of soma uh, in this letter, we can see Christ's body is both transcendent and imminent, present to us in nature, in the Christian gathering, in ourselves, and in the sacrament of Holy Communion. So I haven't um, explicitly talked about other ways in which I see the um, significance of this letter, but I um, perhaps Perhaps might, um, how are we going for time here? Yeah, we're, we're nearly at the end of our time. I think, let, let me throw it over to you to, to, to name some of the things that you'd like to, to include. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Balabanski, for walking us through some of the theology and uh, key themes, um, theological key themes in the letter. Uh, we would like to open up the section to discuss uh, a very real problem that the entire world is facing and is very pronounced uh, in Southern Africa and in the global south at the moment. The uh, pandemic um, is affecting everyone across the globe and it's um, a, a, a wreaking havoc uh, in many communities, especially poorer communities uh, in, uh, in different ways. And there was a question earlier from one of um, our guests, Noman uh, Njali, and she was asking how we can use Colossians to help us reflect on the COVID reality. So if you have any thoughts in that direction, please feel free uh, to guide us. Over to you, Vicky. Mm. Thank you for that question. I think that um, this is a huge, a huge issue and um, one that um, that raises the question of, of suffering more generally, but but very um, uh, significantly. We, we see uh, um, Paul talking about his struggles for um, the Colossians and for those in Laodicea. And he wants their hearts to be encouraged and united in love. I think that um, I think that Paul wants to say that sufferings are not the ultimate truth, but without downplaying the reality of, of suffering. Because um, he he wants to affirm that um, uh, in Christ, um, uh, you know, we are given, we are offered fullness of life. But he also recognises that that many uh, people don't necessarily uh, experience um, that in all its fullness. And so 
I think um, looking at the teachings about hope and the, the way in which hope is connected with with faith and love, I think is is um, is a worthwhile um, direction to go. Uh, also looking at um, uh, yeah at, at what he says about about rejoicing in his own suffering. I mean, it, that's a very mysterious part. That latter part of chapter one, where he says, "I'm rejoicing in my suffering for your sake, and in my flesh, and completing what is lacking in Christ's afflictions, for the sake of His body, that is the church." So, um, I mean, that is a, a really difficult um, uh, teaching, but I think one that's that's worth thinking about. Let me see if I can um, put my finger on. Uh, I mean, I. I my, my chapter on this is all about um, suffering and and the significance of suffering. Uh, but ultimately, I mean, in that section, he talks about the mystery of Christ. And um, so, yeah, I, I, I think that we, we need to recognise that Christ is with us in this suffering, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the suffering is taken away or that we are... Um, screened from it. I think that just as Christ himself um, was not uh, rescued out of the suffering, but went went through it and faced it with us, um, I think we we need to speak to to our communities of um, of Christ's presence with them. It's not an altogether adequate answer, but yeah. Thanks so much for that, Dr. Balabanski. It is tough to hear, mm. hang in there when uh, you're going through suffering because the the obvious desire is to be taken out of a mm. suffering. Um, and um, the example we do get in Colossians is of an enduring apostle who is writing from a posture of suffering himself. So uh, there okay. is this posture of suffering, uh, chains, persecution, and even earthquakes to speak of uh, regional realities that come to uh, the Lakers Valley. So uh, thanks for opening that up for us. Mm -hmm. uh, friends, uh, I'm aware that there are other questions in the room, so I'll give space uh, for uh, one more. Uh, there was a question posted by uh, Safiso Moyo, who was asking, um, uh, first she, uh, she expressed his appreciation and uh, the question was, may I kindly know why the Stoics interrupted Paul on Mars Hill in X 17 when he spoke about uh, the resurrection. I have lost sound, sorry. So uh, if you would like to take that one, um, please feel free. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that question. I think it's a fascinating depiction of, uh, of this interaction between Paul and the, the Stoics and the Epicureans. Although I do think I do think that Paul is making his case primarily to the Stoics. I think that um, when you look at how he shapes the, the sorts of um, uh, things that he alludes to are Stoic writings. Uh, I, I discuss this, um, uh, yeah, in in my commentary, and I just think that um, uh, that that Luke is depicting um, a very um, uh, 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 this interaction between Paul and the other um, uh, the, the philo philosophers there in a way that would 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 resonate with his own um, community uh, who, who know that Stoics are you know have these these particular values. But you're asking about why in particular did they interrupt Paul? I'm not sure I have an answer for that. I'm afraid. Um, yeah. Yes, they, whether they're whether they're interrupting, as, as some scoffed, of course, um, and others said they will hear him again. Um, yeah, I, I think it's interesting to ponder how people from from a pagan background could come to glimpse the gospel. I think that's just a fascinating question that we don't think about enough, and um, and I do think, I mean, as I've been arguing, the um, the, the, the ideas of Stoicism were similar enough to the gospel so that people could get some of the basics, but that they also were longing for something more, some way that, that they recognised that God was reaching out to them graciously, not just kind of a, a closed system that was going to be a constant sort of 
cycle of um, of suffering. Uh, so I think I think that you know this would have been a really attractive I think to some Stoics, but others of course would have needed to hear more or would have scoffed. Yeah. Brilliant. There is a great theological insight that has come into the chat box uh, regarding this question, and the answer is what the Stoics were basically rude. So I'll take that and put it in my next paper and use and quote Dr. Sean Joint on that one. Uh, Sean Joint also asked the question: uh, If Stoicism had this much influence, how much did Epicureanism have? And um, one may say not much, in my opinion, um, but um, not not as much as stoicism as um, uh, so. Yeah, you can. You're free to engage that one if you'd like. But that's my view. Obviously. Just very briefly, I, I think that that Stoics and Epicureans were the kind of the, the kind of key opponents of one another in this period, and um, and so they represented different different emphases. Uh, the Epicureans were were less civic minded hedonistic way but they they saw that as the, the primary motivator uh, whereas stoics didn't see pain or pleasure as being key now have i just dropped out can you still hear me we can hear you you dropped out for a moment but uh, we still have your sound okay. please continue yeah. yes so I, I do think that epicureans were um were around and were active and we certainly see them on the um on the areopagus there um but but I don't think that they were the, the ones who were most open to the gospel. Thanks so much uh, for, for that, uh, Vicky. There was a hand raised. Mark Beru, I see your hand. We will um, invite you to share your views or your question, and you will be the last question of the day. So please keep it short, sir, and over to you. Good afternoon or good evening. Thank you for this one's time to talk. Um, thank you, Doc, for your presentation. It's very informative. I'm sorry to bring you back, but I just want some clarity. You mentioned Stoicism as the backdrop that motivated the letter of the Russians. Uh, I'm just trying to express my understanding. Essentially, that the author was using the pre understanding to advance the gospel. Uh, whereas I've, I've noticed Gnosticism is what other scholars use as the underlying idea that Paul was arguing against. Am I correct in my understanding? Maybe you can correct me. Thanks. Yes, thank, thank you, Mark, for that question. I think I, I think I heard you, um, although the, the line's not altogether that clear. Um, so you're asking about the significance of, of Gnosticism uh, in comparison to Stoicism. Uh, I, I should say I'm, I'm not arguing that Stoicism motivated the letter. I, I don't want to claim that. I think the gospel motivated the letter, but I think that the Stoic background helped people understand and that there are certain stoic um, ways of framing things in this letter that, um, that would have resonated with the people in the Lycus Valley, the people in Asia Minor were, were exposed to stoicism. Um, when we come to Gnosticism, it's an interesting question. I see Gnosticism as not yet fully formed. I think there are proto-Gnostic ideas that are being formed um, in the late the, the later part of the first century, um, and that we see some of those being being shaped in the Johannine context, um, and by this you know this uh, the time of the Johannine epistles, we we see some of those things um, taking shape. Fully fully blown Gnosticism, of course, is, is um, you know second century phenomenon. But I do, um, I, do, I do think that Gnosticism is relevant because it really couldn't have formed without a kind of bringing a very strong Hellenistic framework into dialogue with the, gos with, with the gospel. I think that when you, when you transplant the gospel directly onto a, um, a, a kind of platonic framework, you end up with a kind of Gnostic um, view. 
that um, that sees the the divine spark, you know, uh, descending from uh, from God and then then ascending again. Uh, so I, I do think that that is a phenomenon, and I do think that that does reflect uh, uh, an aspect of philosophy. But I but um, but that's a little bit different from um, Stoicism. I think Stoicism was very much a practical kind of um, uh, everyday koine kind of way of looking at the world uh, that uh, that was well known, as I mentioned, among kind of slaves, you know, and and business people and emperors, you know, various people uh, took on aspects of, of Stoic thought. I'll stop there. Thank you. Brilliant answer and a very good question. Thank you so much, Mark. That was the last question of the day. Friends, colleagues, um, visitors, uh, this has been a walk through Colossians, uh, many aspects related to Colossians uh, by Dr. Vicky Balabanski. We are so grateful to you, Vicky, for joining us today, and we'd like to say thank you for an excellent uh, presentation. It's been wonderful dialoguing with you and engaging the text with you and seeing different dimensions to the text that may inform our faith and also our relationship with the church and um, each other. Mm -hmm. Friends, I would like to say may this I just say is thank the you end. As well. Yeah. Yes. I'll, I'll, uh, thank I'll you so much for having me. It's been great. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much, Vicky. Uh, perhaps you'd like to uh, just dis, um, say a few more words if you'd like to, because um, I wanted to end over I the mic to I, you before. It's it's a it's a, a real pri privilege and pleasure to um, to speak with you and to hear your feedback and your comments. Um, and I, I appreciate them. I'll think more about them as I as I go. And uh, if you would like to email me, I will endeavour to answer your emails and. Uh, uh, so I'd be very happy to keep that dialogue going. Thank you very much. And thank you, Bash, um, particularly to, for inviting me.